Welcome to the Once Upon a Sketch podcast. I'm Wilson Williams Jr. And I'm Norman Grock. In our podcast series, we'll be presenting interviews, insights, education, and news about the many facets of the children's illustration market, from children's books to character design, storyboarding, toys, and licensed products. We use our quest for knowledge to help educate you on your journey to success. Before we get started, we just wanted to um, touch base with our listeners to let you know about uh, the podcast and kind of why we disappeared right after we had appeared. And um, Norm's going to speak on that a little bit. Uh, So the evening before we were getting ready to uh, do our third podcast, uh, my wife went into labor. Um, and this was very much not planned, uh, essentially two months early, my son was born and, uh, I'd been at the hospital quite a bit, uh, and I hadn't had very much time to work on the website or the podcast. So, uh, sincerest apologies, but really couldn't have been helped. Uh, family matters take precedent. To say the least, and so a big congrats goes goes out to my bro Norm um, for the new addition to his family. Uh, so there, there's no excuse better than the excuse of a new life in the world. So that's that's always a, a welcome excuse for not having a podcast. So well, now we're going to try to get back on track and give you a new podcast every first Monday of the month. There you go. So if you guys have any. Any suggestions for people that you would like to hear us interview or speak with or aspects of the industry that you would like us to find professionals to speak about, let us know. Send us an email. All right. Let's get to the interview with Mike. Thanks a lot, guys. Today at Once Upon a Sketch, we are happy to speak with Mike Mayhack, an illustrator and webcomic creator responsible for the creation of such series as Cow and Buffalo, Seed, and the newly acquired by Scholastic series Cleopatra in Space. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Hi, how's it going? It's going great. <laughs> so uh, it's great to have you on the show. Um, we've been following a lot of your work for a while now. So when we saw that, um, that a lot of big changes are happening with you and your career and your creations, we definitely wanted to get you on the show and, and talk with you a little bit and get to know you a little bit better. Cool. Well, thanks, for, thanks for following me. <laughs> <laughs> not a problem. Uh, so um, tell us a little bit about yourself and what drove you to pursue illustration. Uh, well, uh, man, what pers- oh, why did I start drawing? Uh, I, you know, I, I like stories a lot. Um, it's probably what kind of drives me in, in any sort of, I don't know, media. Is the, even, even music, um, the kind of storytelling involved in it. Um, and I think the only way... I, I'm not a very good writer. <laughs> I can't write music. So I think the only way I kind of knew how to tell stories was just to start drawing them. Um, even from a young age, I uh, like the, you know, like the old comic strips from the newspaper and things like that. I would make my own sort of, sort of like three panel comics and things like that. Um, and I don't know. And I just, just kept doing it. I liked, I liked, I liked it. I liked drawing <laughs> kind of introverted you know as a kid so it's an easy thing to kind of get into that you can do by yourself i think so just kind of kept at it and um people liked it you know they liked what i was working on so um so i I think that helped too to kind of keep me keep me working at it um i liked i liked that people liked something i was doing (laughs) that helps um what what, do you, what is it that you feel like that people gravitate to your style? It's really playful and fun. How'd you come up with that? Uh, you know, I I actually have no idea what you know what gravitates people to, you know, to my style. It always it, it always confounds me because uh, um, I see so many other artists out there that uh, that are, you know influences on me. So they're just, they're so great. They're so good. And every day I look at my stuff and just think it's so awful. <laughs> I'm like, oh. It's, 
this is not good. Um, and, you know, I, li- I like the work that I do, but um, I'm always trying to get better at it. And I think was like, you know, influences, you know, it's just, I think my style is just kind of developed from looking at all these, these other artists that, that are really influential to me. And, um, and either just sort of, you know, from, you know, you know, you know, backtracking a little, I think, um, you know, Raina Tugmire just did a great post on style about where that comes from. Um, and I had never really, <laughs> never really thought about it before looking at our examples, but it was like, you know, one of the things was like copying styles, and that's how I kind of started, was just copying different cartoonists. Um, and then those influences from other cartoonists kind of creeped in, and your style just kind of starts to develop from all that. And I guess from being a fan of um, kind of newspaper comic strips, um, animation, um, and less, I think, less the actual comic book, uh, like uh, American superhero kind of stuff. Um, I think my style kind of got more playful because of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't, you know, I just didn't put a lot of detail. <laughs> it sounds terrible, but I just don't put a lot of detail in my work. I like things very simple. And um, but in order to convey the subject matter appropriately, I have to, you have to learn ways to um, to sort of put enough detail that shows that, so then your style sort of kind of develops from that. Um, I don't know if the answer makes any sense. <laughs> no, no, no. Are there, was there anybody in particular, um, any specific strips, any specific cartoonist or uh, that played into that you were particularly drawn to and that, or that inspired you? Any ones that were your favorites? Oh, yeah. Well, um, I think probably the first cartoonist I ever got into was probably Jim Davis. You know, with the Garfield strips, and that's when I was was very, very young. Uh, I mean, this is elementary school. Um, and then from there, I got really into Calvin and Hobbes. I got really into Far Side, and um, and then uh, Bloom County, which later you know was Outland. Um, and those, I think, were the like, the core that I that I really got into in terms of uh, what. What I want, like that's kind of what I wanted to do for the longest time, do a newspaper trip, something like that. Um, but it wasn't so, uh, and I like, and, and then I got into like X Men was like the first like actual superhero kind of floppy comic book that I got into, like sequential sort of, you know, long like drama story. You know? um, and I I liked it, but I didn't want to. I didn't want to do that for some reason. I just that. I want to do, I was still kind of more towards the, more, I don't want, want to say, say cartoony, but more humor. Humor is a better word, the humor side of things. And, um, and it wasn't until I, I found Bone, um, where I realized there was, there was a sort, there was a sort of combination of the two. I was like, oh, you can do like this humor style strip thing, you know, as, you know, as a long, long form drama and um and I liked that and I, I realized that's what I wanted to do it's like and um he was probably the first the first artist that made me go oh yeah I want to do comics I want to do this I want to tell a story uh I, I want to I want it to be funny but I also want to have have impacts you know I want to have re, uh, repercussions for characters things like that um and I I loved that it was in black and white. I had no desire to do a comic in color because I loved how well that looked in black and white. I just, you know, wanted to do something just like that. Now, was that was were you reading that book while you were in college, or was that did you discover that afterwards? I discovered Bone in high school. Uh, I I picked the, I think the first issue I picked up was issue seven, uh, and I don't even I honestly. How did I find that book? I think I might have found it through an article Wizard magazine had put. They did like a little, I think they used to do like a spotlight of like independent comics at one point. It's hard to remember it's been so long, but I think that, and I, something about the, the art style resonated with me and I, I found the book at a comic book. Or, you know, I 
think I did. I found the first six six books in an old in an old tray. Pick that up. But seven is my very first. Not issue seven is my very first actual issue of it. My first printing. So you know, still has that. This is before. Oh man, this is when he was. The, the, the print of the comic is still like that newsprint, really thin uh, paper. Uh-huh. You know, the, late, later, all the comics started doing you know, more glossy and, and mm-hmm. thick and white. But man, there's just something about there's just something about those old issues of Bone with that newsprint and the smell of the newsprint. That just there's this um, there's this aesthetic to it that that added, I guess, to the to the type of comic that it was. Um, you know, I mentioned that I like the newspaper strips and stuff. Um, and that kind of, it kind of reminded me of that, I think, a lot. Um, I'm totally going on a tangent. I'm, I'm, you, you've got me reminiscing now, so don't worry. <laughs> Discovered this stuff and making me think. But, yeah, I mean, that, yeah, that was in, in high school where I, I first kind of discovered that book. Um, you know, then there were there were later books after that 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 really influenced me as well. But that was the first. How how long have you been uh, creating comics for? Uh, well, let's see, um, not really not that long. Um, I mean, I used to do little these little comic strips in in, um, in high school and and into college, but I, you know, I didn't. This is before. This is before really the internet, really, um, and you know, so I wasn't. Yeah, they're probably scattered in notebooks at my my parents' house and things like that, or or we trade them with friends. I remember drawing little comic strips at the lunch table, you know, um, spin out ideas, and most of them are just, you know, I look back, and most of them are probably just a little disturbing because we're all teenagers and we thought like the stupidest stuff was the funniest thing. Um, and maybe it was. Maybe they were really funny at that time. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I didn't really start getting serious about doing a comic until uh, I started with uh, Seed, which was uh, straight after college. I, I had, you know, drawn the characters and kind of come up with the story concept through college and I started to draw it after college, and um, that's when the internet was pretty much in full effect at that point. I just started putting it on the web. So I would say I've probably been drawing you know, college for about 13, 12 years, 12, 13 years now. So I'd say about, you know, about a decade of drawing comics. And, and during that time, you had like a, you were working just like a normal nine to five job as a designer? Oh, uh, well, let's see, yeah. during that time, yeah, I mean, it was just, it was a normal, what was I doing? I was, uh, oh, I worked at a frame shop when I first went right out of college for about six years, you know, custom framing, um, which was an awesome job. I love, I love custom framing. Um, it wasn't very, I guess it kind of was creative, but I mean, in terms of drawing, it wasn't, but there are these moments in between the day where you could sort of, um, you know, kind of do stuff on your own. Um, Do you st- there was one point during the during the framing job that I this is I mean this is after when I worked on C I kind of worked on like a big chunk of the comic and put it all up at once um, which was really tough and I don't know what my actual I think I just wanted to just publish C you know I just wanted to do this comic called C and I had a great story planned out and then all these things started kind of happening out there that made me not as interested in the story anymore because other people were doing it better. And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. You know, that's way better than what I had planned. And it just kind of took my desire out of it. And um, so I guess that's when I started uh, Cow and Buffalo. was after that. Um, did, so you had, a full, you had a full-time job while you were doing your comics. Are you yeah. still are you still at the full time job or is that uh, are you are you freelance now sort of? Oh, I'm freelance now. Um, I had a full time job up until about last summer, so I've only been. I mean, I was doing freelance during the full time job, but um, uh, yeah, I worked at a universe.
University, um, kind of doing graphic design for uh, like another six years. This is right after the training job. Um, and that was great. I mean, it was a good, it was, it was a really good job to sort of, because I was able, I had, I had a lot of, this is, because now that I'm not at the job, it's okay to, to kind of say this, but, you know, <laughs> but I had, a, you know, I had a lot of, um, a lot of freedom there, and uh, it was a, a wonderful job, because I, I could, I, I had my own computer, I had my own desk, I had my own little space, and um, I just come in in the morning, and just sort of warm up for the day, I would just kind of do these little drawings, and, and, and post them online, and just not post them online if I didn't feel like it, and, um, and that's where I, I was able to really start focusing on a career in, in art, I think. Um, that's where all the more, I guess, uh, uh, professional type stuff I started doing kind of developed by having a job like that. Um, and because it was a day job, I didn't really have to worry about make, like, making too much money off the, like, the comics I was working on. Um, because they job was sort of financing that. And I was still work on them on the weekends and when I got home and things like that. But I was able to get a lot of that, you know, that initial work done while I was at the job, as well as the writing in my head on the drive, the commute back and forth from work. That was always, I kind of miss that, actually. I did a lot of writing in my head, driving back and forth from work and kind of come up with ideas. Um, I remember one, one drive to work is... It was right after I had drawn, um, I drew, like, this cover uh, for Super, uh, Batgirl Supergirl for, like, the, when, you know, DC was doing a New 52, and we did all the books that we wanted to see um, for this uh, this thing that John Morris was putting together. And, uh, and then uh, one of my, you know, one of my friends... Uh, Nate Cosby said that, you know, you need to do a comic for, for, for Batgirl Supergirl. And I was like, I should, you know, but, you know, so I, was, I remember just driving to work and um, think, what should, what would I do with a comic for Batgirl Supergirl? And then uh, I just thought about it I, on my way to work and, you know, it just kind of came pretty quickly. And as soon as I got to work, I just drew it because it was in my head. And um, that's a nice thing about having a day, day job, well, a day job like that. <laughs> um <laughs> Because, uh, you know, I don't, I don't really have that, right, sort of, sort of, just think of ideas strong and stuff. They usually wake up and start working. Um, but, yeah, that's, that was fun, just sort of being able to write in my head a lot of times. I have no, am I, am I answering the question? I, I, you know, I tend to ramble quite a bit. <laughs> And I'll just go on. So if I if I start getting long winded or, or talk about something that's completely off subject, just stop me. No, Mike, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> um, so you started out. Your first web comic that you did was C, um, and then after that, you moved on to Callum Buffalo, right? Yeah, yeah. Then I moved on to Callum Buffalo. So what was Callum Buffalo about? I, well, <laughs> oh, you know, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this up because my friend Keith. I, I, I saved this because it was so perfect. He, uh, my friend Keith, he was a big Cow Buffalo fan, and I think he's still mad that I stopped working on it. Um, but he, uh, he, he gave me like the perfect description of what Cow Buffalo is, so I'm going to read it here. Um, he says, I guess Cow Buffalo is, at its heart, two opposite ends, continuously debating and trying to reach a consensus and understanding of the other. And when a consensus is reached, the two become one, and that one is then willing to go fight evil aliens and break rules confident in their own internal assessment that what they've decided is right. Um, and when, I, when I'm at conventions and people ask me what Count Buffalo is about, I just tell them, oh, man, it's just a ridiculous book. <laughs> <laughs> So I thought it was just hilarious how he just he came up with this thing. And I was like, you know what? That's perfect. It's exactly what it is. It's two sides. It's just conversations I have with myself inside my head, you know, trying to um, come to, like, a some sort of mutual agreement about something, about life, about this sort of, you know, 
you know, this event that I've encountered or, or whatever. And it, but it's done in a way that's um, just completely ridiculous and very, I think, influenced by like my love of like Monty Python or, or Wes Anderson and, and like this little kind of dry sort of humor. Um, it, it's I don't know. I, that's why I don't even know how to explain what that comic is about. Well. But that's that's pretty close. Well, then what um, I know you mentioned for C, you know, is that a part of the reason that you stopped doing it was that you saw a lot of other people doing what you were trying to do, but you thought they were doing it better. So oh. what made you stop doing Cow and Buffalo? Well, Cow and Buffalo kind of stopped. Well, initially when I started Cow and Buffalo, it was really, uh, you know, I was working on the C, and it was a long-term thing. It was, getting a lo- it was taking a long time to get, like, something done um, to get, like, the story out. Um, and I was, you know, I think I was a lot slower in artist than now. But. So when I started Count Buffalo, it was sort of, it started off as just, you know, I'm just going to do like a quick, you know, go back to my love of the comic scripts from the, news, you know, from when I used to read in the newspaper and do something quick like that and see if I just get one done on a lunch break during work and just, you know, and, and that'll be that. And, or, you know, like sort of just, it started off actually very early on, it's sort of a kind of diary comic where um, I would take Cow and Buffalo, you know, Count Pearl, something actually happened directly in my life, and later I stopped being that entirely. But um, so it started off just the way, like, can I, can I draw? Can I draw a complete? Do I can I draw a complete story in six panels instead of coming up with these grand epic ideas that I'm never going to be able to finish? Um, so that's how it started, and. After I think oh, I did come up for about six years, um, you know, I really if you go through Count Buffalo too, which is funny. I, I, I wanted to do these stories that only lasted like kind of six panels, and then there there was at one point where I I did I'm going to do this to, you know to be continued, and, and then the story would go on for an entire year of these little six panel strips. So I pretty much failed with that experiment. Looking back. But, <laughs> um, but I, I reached a point where I just felt I wasn't, I had done kind of what I wanted to do um, with that concept, and I didn't feel I was really growing as an artist by continuing to work on it. Um, there was, for one thing, there was no, there was no humans really, for the most part, in the, in the strip. So um, just my, I think, I thought my anatomy skills were declining. <laughs> um, they just had hooks for hands, but I wasn't really... Um, practicing drawing hands, which is something I really thought probably needed to work on. And in just terms of my storytelling, they weren't very three-dimensional character. In just terms of you know physicality, they weren't very three-dimensional. So laying out pages and panels and things like that, I just wanted to do something more. Um, and it wasn't until I drew this like Cleopatra in space illustration, and, and you know another thing that people said, "Hey, you should make that comic." Um, I was like, "Yeah, I should make that comic." And I started coming up with ideas for it and started drawing it. And I realized that I'm kind of into this more now, this, doing this sort of thing. So it was really Cleopatra in space that, that, that made me stop doing combo flow because I was having more fun at it, really. Now, there was a very specific event or site or something I remember reading about that was what created the initial idea, or at least the imagery for Cleopatra in space, right? Yeah, yeah. It was um, called Drawer Geeks, and it was this site, um, it was had by this guy named uh, um, Greg Harden, and he worked for um, Big I- yeah, Big Idea at the time. He had a company that, like, Betty Tail, things like that. So there were a lot of these animation professionals <laughs> that were in this uh, this site where we were given a, a subject every two weeks, and we would just kind of draw whatever the, the character or subject was, you know, in, in our style or however we want to do it. And uh, oh man, that was that was such a great. If I could look back at at, at of, of a group or, or something that really helped me hone hone my skills and um, helped me like kind of look outside the box and be better as an artist and get more influences. It was probably that site um, because it forced me to draw things that normally wouldn't have drawn otherwise. Um, And I always wanted to draw, I always wanted to try different styles because it wasn't for anything. It wasn't for like a client. 
um, I was able to just practice, like, oh, what if I do it this way? What if I draw something like this? Or what if I don't take the subject seriously? What if I do take it seriously? So, um, so that's one, it, you know, going back to your question, that was where, you know, Cleopatra was the subject one, one time, and I, and I drew her in space, um, because why not? <laughs> I was, you know, just, I don't know why I drew her in space. I actually had the, the same logo that's, that's still used on the website today. I wrote Cleopatra in space and uh, gave her the, you know, put a cat next to her and called him Kensu, who, um, uh, you, you know, looking looking up stuff at the time, I found he was like the Egyptian god of like, space and time. He was like the Doctor Who of... Egyptian gods. Um, so, uh, but he, I don't know, I'd make a name for a cat for a sidekick. And, yeah. and that's just kind of how it developed. And people like, you know, people like that concept. They, they said, they you should make that a comic. Yeah, I should make that a comic. You know, that would be fun. You know, it'd be like Buck Rogers, you know, but, but Cleopatra. Um, that's just kind of how it started. It's from that. Well, seeing as how you were able to have a full-time day job to supplement your ability to do the webcomic, you know, in the evenings when you got home and were able to do it on your own time, did you ever feel, was there ever any true need for the webcomic to produce its own revenue, to support itself, you know, like to pay for it, you being on the server, to pay for you going to conventions, was you know, or was it always just something you could do for fun? And at what, at what point did it become a potential source of income, and if so, how? Uh, yeah, I was never, I was actually never concerned about making money off of it. Uh, I think, you know, I, I think eventually I wanted to make a living off of, you know, after I started really thinking about Clay Passion Space and getting serious about it and what I wanted to do with the comic, um, I did eventually want to start making a living off of it. I wasn't too concerned with, you know, when I started doing it with making money off the site or off the webcomic. And uh, that kind of stayed true the entire time I was working at it. If you, if you look at the site, there's no ads on it. Um, the, really, the only way to make, you know, to, 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 to give me money from it is to buy the merchandise and stuff like that. Um, which, you know, I didn't really sell too many prints and things of it. Um, and then the books. Um, but, it, but I still, had I not you know, still books and prints and things. I still kept working on on the comic because I, I liked working on it. It was fun. And I guess my hope was eventually just to to find a, you know, to, to, to either self-publish it or find a publisher and, and, and go that route. Um, and we could go into a, a whole other conversation about, you know, doing kids' material on the web and what's maybe not the best that source right now, but maybe we get there later. But um, but yeah, I mean, I just wanted to do it for fun. I wasn't really concerned about making money off of it. And you know, let's see, what was the second part of the question? I'm I'm sorry to. <laughs> it, it was about the the potential revenue stream from from because I know from from everything that I've seen of you is that you definitely are had a presence at conventions and I know tabling and all of that stuff at those conventions is expensive you know I think um, I'm not sure how many conventions you went to, went to and I know you were always at MegaCon in Orlando and I know you lived in Tampa so you probably didn't have to worry as much but that went about the cost of transporting your materials but if you ever did shows that were in other parts of the country I know it can get pretty expensive to go to conventions yeah. and, and show your stuff and table. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was still, I was still doing a lot of freelance at the time, like, um, like, you know, logo designs, graphic designs, things like that. And yeah, there was the day chat that kind of helped matters a little bit. And so a lot of that would, would kind of go towards, um, you know, what about check, you know, looking back, you know, whether it you know, really what it was was Tom Buffalo that kind of started. When I did the first Tom Buffalo book, um, and that was my first convention with my first book. Um, I saved all that money that I kept making. After I paid off the loan that I got for the for the book, I kept saving the money for that. 
and then that went towards the second book. So the money that actually started from doing those first two Count Buffalo books is kind of what's financed doing, like, another convention, and then that convention is sort of financed doing another convention um, through the books that people were buying from, or the books and the prints for that matter that was selling, the, you know, from the material that was online. And I would, I would kind of, I would save that money in sort of a business account, and I, I wouldn't touch it except for business use. Um, and so I wasn't really, I guess, too concerned with making money off. I guess I should have been. <laughs> I should have been more concerned about making money off the site. I think I was just, I was more, I was more into just getting the, drawing the comic and getting it done. And all the other stuff, all the marketing, all the business side of the things just was, get, would get in the way. And because I had a day job, I didn't have to worry about it so much because I had the day job to kind of help with all the other bills and expenses and things that they kind of cover up through the day. And, um, and I didn't have a, I didn't have a child either. <laughs> so that was a, that was a big part. Um, I didn't have any, you know, I didn't really have anybody that needed to, um, support. Um, so, <laughs> so yeah, I guess look, you know, looking back, it was, it was the conventions that kind of supported the, each convention and going out to them. Um, I'd make enough money that actually would, um, be able to still put away some for later and, and afford to go to the next one. Um, and that's just kind of how I, I, I was able to keep going to a, a few. And I don't do many conventions at all. I mean, I do, I think the most I've ever done a year is maybe seven. And that was a lot. I don't know if I would ever be able to do that again. Uh, but last year I only did three. Um, this year I'm probably only going to be doing three. Um, so, you know, I don't do too many anymore. But, um, yeah, yeah, but yeah, now that you mention that, now that I'm looking back, um, I should have been looking at making more money off the actual webcomic itself. <laughs> 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 I, just, I don't know, I just didn't, I, it wasn't a concern for me. And I, I just wanted to draw the comic. Well, I think that's the thing. I think a lot of artists have a. Uh a problem, you know, all we really want to do is just create the artwork. I don't think any of us really have a, as much of a mind for the business angle of of that type of thing when you're actually creating your own product and you need to market it, you need to sell it, you need to get it produced and all of the things that go into that. A lot of artists are just like, oh, can I just draw? You know, that's just a lot of stuff that people just don't readily want to necessarily deal with, which is why a lot of them have agents. Um, <laughs> and whatnot yeah. within the industry. I have an I have an agent now, and I, I was just I mean, just this week we were going back and forth on this this one job, and um, I was like, man, I don't know how I ever ha- ever had like a mildly successful freelance career before having an agent. Um, they're, they're just invaluable. I just, uh, totally recommend um, anyone, and just and just in terms of like trying to. Uh, negotiate contracts and things like that. Um, recommend anyone, you know, just get one. They can. <laughs> okay, Mike. Well, let's, let's see. Let's get into a little bit of the details of how you produce your, your artwork. Uh, are you, like I know for, for me, it's, you know, sketch traditionally first and then do scan it in and work digitally and, and whatnot. How do you work on your, on your pages for your, for your web comics? Pretty much exactly how you said. Um, I'll draw um, traditionally just enough that I need to that I know what I need to get done to, to scan in. Um, so then I scan it in, and then I finish the rest up digitally. And most of that usually it's just the, the like spotted blacks, things like that. But I'll actually fix some line work sometimes, or or actually redraw like a whole whole section if I need to. But I still draw traditionally, and then I do all the post work and coloring uh, in the computer. When you use Photoshop or oh yeah, and I use Photoshop to do it all. When you, when you're creating uh, your stories and your comics, do you work from a script or do you uh, sketch it out first, or how, how do you how do you create the stories? Uh, well, it's changed um, since I started working on on the graphic novel. I had my my first approach was to um, I would draw just a quick little thumbnail. Um, for that page and then draw that page and then finish it up and then for the next page I would just do the process and it was almost like a one page at a time process 
even though I kind of knew where the story was going and have, have it written out, there wasn't a script. There was maybe some dialogue doodles on the side of the last page. Um, and sometimes I would maybe thumbnail about five pages out at a time, but for the most part, it was kind of a one page at a time process. But now, working on the graphic novel, because um, I have an editor that needs to see the whole thing at once, I actually, I, it was way more involved. I, I, I created um, an immense backstory, for one, of the entire story, um, stuff that won't even probably ever be in the comic, um, and created an outline. Um, and then I write, in, pretty much write in dialogue. So I write almost like, like a, not, I wouldn't really a screenplay, but more like a like a play, um, where a, 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 actors are like entering the stage and, and just and just dialogue, um, characters talking, and just go from there, and then edit edit that up, and then from that from that dialogue, um, and those scenes, I would work on on my thumbnails, and usually my thumbnails before they were very small, um, kind of sketchy. Nobody would even know what they were. But for this for this first uh, Cleopatra book, I did all the thumbnails, almost actual size, digitally in the computer instead of by pen. Um, and they were, they're actually, they're, they're pretty readable. <laughs> I was like, looking through, I was like, next time I do this, I need to just, um, just go straight to the penciling stage because uh, most of the pages I ended up drawing, um, are really close to what I, I, I did with the thumbnails. Um, but from that, from those thumbnails, I would print those thumbnails out, and then I would actually go and redraw the page by hand and then go in and, and, and do the rest of the hand digitally, like I said. So I actually, I did, I thumbnailed the entire book out, you know, but it was really, I, the writing really took place in the thumbnails. Um, there was just kind of dialogue and outline where it needed to go. For the, the actual scripts phase of it all, how long how long does it normally take you to produce a page? It depends on the page. Um, usually, take I mean, a thumbnail can take anywhere. Well, these thumbnails I was working on for this book would take anywhere from like an, a half hour to an hour to get the, the thumbnail ready. Um, and then, what's nice about having a really detailed thumbnail is that took my penciling stage has, has, has decreased. So I can actually nail out maybe a drawing page in a couple hours if I need to. Um, but maybe about an hour post and then three to four hours coloring. So, you know, get full, full work day, I guess, to get one page done. Um, I work on two pages at once, so I try to get two pages done a day. Uh, but that's split up, um, you know, two, you know, split up in the pencil, you know, penciling, inking, and coloring. So you, so you can go from a thumbnail to a finished colored uh, page in a day. Yeah, I'd say in one day. Yeah. That's pretty. That's pretty impressive. I yeah, I guess I don't know what the average is for for most artists. I imagine it's it's got to be somewhere uh, more than that uh, for a lot of for a lot of artists out there that you know sell monthly books and things like that. Yeah, you're doing. Uh, I was just going to say that uh, I, I had always read that, like, you know, for a, for like a, a mainstream comic book, it was like a day for the uh, for the pencils. Like people could do one page in a day, just pencils. And yeah. it, seemed, it just sounds impressive to go from um, a sketch to a finished piece in a day. That sounds, that's awesome. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, and, you know, my stuff isn't too detailed either. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned it earlier. So, uh, but thanks. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm always trying to up my speed. I think uh, part of it too is work on, on a graphic novel. Um, you don't have a lot of time to just sit there and because you have a you have a hard deadline to get the book to, especially when you're working for a publisher. And I mean, there's probably pages I could have sat there and spent longer on. Um, but you got to kind of pick and choose the, the moments and. Is this, is this something that I need to be spending longer on, or is this move the story along quicker? Is it move the story along slower? And, um, you can't always, you know, you can't always, you know, make the perfect page, you know. And sometimes you just have to kind of compromise time versus, um, um, you know, quality, I guess. That said, I'm, I'm really, I don't know, I'm 
really happy with that. Now that I'm at, I've, I've drawn the whole book, I'm just going through coloring it. Uh, I'm getting through, and I'm like, man, how did I? I must have been in the zone drawing this page because it's like I don't know if I would be able to draw this now. I don't know how I drew it then. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with the work I've done so far on the book. Well, I noticed that um, when you have your web comic up, you know it's it's free and there for everybody to come and see all of everything that you've done up until this point with like with Cleopatra in space. But you also produce physical books that a person somebody can come in and purchase if they want a physical copy. Um, what printer do you use, or who do you go through to produce that stuff? Because I know some artists use like local like Create Space, and there's different especially um, comic book publishers that'll do uh, books for you if you send, you know, your own self-published thing into them. But I know a lot of the, I've noticed that a lot of creators also get a lot of their stuff produced overseas um, with other Japanese publishers and whatnot. So what do you, what, who do you use to produce your physical books? Uh, I've used a couple printers. The, um, the first the first company I used for the, the first couple of Combo Flow books, and then also later on for the, the second Clio one I, I did, was a printer called Transcontinental. Uh, they're located in Canada, I think Quebec, I don't know, somewhere in Canada. And I used them just because uh, I was just looking through different books on my bookshelf. You know, since somebody, a book that I liked the quality of, they had used that printer. Um, and, you know, they do a good job. Um, the thing about that is you're, you're, buying, you're buying a bulk. You know, I had to buy at least 500 to start off and then, and then you have to be kind of confident that you can sell this, that amount of, amount, amount of books or just hopeful that you can sell that amount of books when you do something like that. The other printer I use is uh, Indigo Inc., and they're located here in the States in Maryland. Um, and they're, they're great. They do a great job. They print the first Clio book. Um, what's nice about that is it's real easy to get reprints of it. Um, I still order a bulk to get a better price. Uh, but I like the quality. Um, that was very helpful with the last, you know, the, I'm not going to be able to sell my own self-published books anymore. So I was selling out the stock, and I came back from the convention after selling all my first Clio books. This was just MegaCon a month ago. And uh, I had all these orders. Because I, I guess I, cause I, had just, I had just put on my website about this classic thing, how I wouldn't have books available, but I completely forgot to shut down my store. So I, like, I came back to all these orders for Cleo books, and I was like, shoot, I sold out of them all. I don't have any. So it was really helpful to have a printer here in the States that I could just order a quick, a quick run to cover that and get them very quickly. Um, so Indigo Inc. Is, is that one. But those are the only two printers I've ever used. Okay, so that's just good. It's like that, you know, for, for little minis. Well, mentioning the change in your um, status, uh, it's a good transition for us into your new situation with Scholastic. You know, that Scholastic has picked up Cleopatra in space and is going to be publishing uh, some graphic novels with you. Um, how did that partnership come to be? Because a lot of people want it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it was kind of nice um, that they that they they were interested in it because uh, um, you know like I mentioned before it kind of came at a good time where I had just had my son and uh, wanted to be spending more time with them and you know it allowed me to leave my day job and just do that but uh, it's funny it's the the way it happened I wasn't it's not like I was I wasn't looking to to, to publish play passion space with anybody. At the time, uh, my focus was just to get the whole story arc of the webcomic done. But I was at San Diego, um, the Comic-Con, it's, it's been two years now. Um, it was a 2000, so it was a 2000, it doesn't matter, two years ago. Um, and one, there's a, there's a, you know, there's a guy that kind of heads the, the book fairs, the, the classic books, you know, the ones that with the, you know, the, you know, the things that go to school and stuff like that, uh -huh. and he picked up he picked up the books and said, you know, "I remember, I remember him too." So, like, I think this would be great for for book for book fairs. And I'm like, "Can you give me his card and stuff?" I'm like, "Oh, that's great." You know, and I didn't really think anything of it at the time because um, 
I mean, this sounds terrible. <laughs> I don't mean it to sound terrible, but you get a lot of people that come up to you um, and say, oh, this would be great for this, or this would be this and this. And you, after a while, you just start, nothing ever comes of it, and you just start, kind of become sort of phased, I guess, by it all. Um, but that's what happened. He picked it up, and I guess he showed it to um, uh, David Saylor. I mean, it's the graphics division there at Scholastic. And they, they, uh, they emailed me, I looked an email a few weeks after I got back from the show that they were interested in it. Uh, and if I had ever, you know, if I was interested in working with an editor and, you know, what my plans were for the, for the series and things like that. So, um, I actually hadn't considered it up until then. Uh, I was just focused on trying to get the story I had done. But I had a story in my head of, you know, not a story, but I had the story of how she actually got to the future, how, how, how that all happened. And I was like, man, I really would love to be able to, to have a, a place where I could tell that story without having to, to do it slowly, week by week by week. Um, because it's one of those stories that just, it, it doesn't warrant it. it needs, you need to read it all at once. Um, and so we... You know, I, I put together a, a proposal for them. Uh, I gave them the, pretty much the first 20 pages of the book, um, completely done. Um, uh, sent it in, and they liked it. And um, I got an agent to help me through the contract, <laughs> which I recommend. Um, and then the, uh, that was that. That's kind of how it happened. It was sort of circumstance, and then after that, it was a lot of hard work. It took about a year from the point of, uh, you know, them being interested to me actually doing the work, submitting it, getting a response, and then accepting it, you know, uh, to, to, you know, to publish it. So is, is it all new work, or is uh, the webcomic going to be uh, work into it as well? Yeah, it's completely new work. Um, the webcomic, that storyline, I won't redo it. I'm not going to redraw it or anything like that. Uh, but it, it'll fit sort of, it, I'm not going to, if you read all the all the graphic novels, if I get actually able to do nine, that story it will be on its own. That will fit sort of well in the middle of it because it's just sort of how I've structured the story. Um, but it's all new material. I'm not doing anything. I'm not retreading. I'm not going to reprint anything. So. Uh, by the way, I'd like to say that that's an exclusive, that there's going to be nine books. That is an exclusive. <laughs> yeah. that, that, I just sort of spit that out. Not, uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> yes, I, you know, there's only a few. I think I told uh, my agent knows that I want to do nine books. Uh, my publisher has no clue. <laughs> Last <laughs> doesn't know I want to do nine books, uh, but they do know I want to do more than two. So uh, the the point of that is everybody buy those first two books so I can do all nine. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> well, you you mentioned that um you won't be able to sell the self published books anymore. Uh, how what what other changes come into the deal with with Scholastic? Um, is it an exclusivity thing with them where, you know, all of your previous stuff can no longer be published? And, or, or how, how does that work specifically? Uh, you know, it's funny. When we, when we, uh, when we first started uh, discussing uh, the book and the deal started coming up, um, they weren't, there wasn't really much awareness of the webcomic um, because they had, they had the physical books, you know, that they picked up at, at, at San Diego. Um, and I had already planned on starting the chapter three of the webcomic. And I, you know, I remember asking ask my agent about this. I was like, um, you know, what, what about the webcomic? You know, can I keep working on that? And it was, it was kind of a thing because it was like, well, what, 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 hold off, you know, that's, that's going to be, that's going to be different. Um, because what Scholastic has is they have the exclusive publishing rights for Cleopatra in space, uh, which is why I can't do my self-published books because that would be kind of a conflict. They want to, they're, it's, they're buying Cleopatra in space as a, as a publishing product and they want to market that, you know, and they want to have control over that, which they should. 
Um, so if I have something else that's out there, that's going to be that's going to conflict with what I'm putting out for with, with Scholastic. Now the web comic's different because it's not really out there, you know, uh, published. So uh, we actually were able to negotiate something where I was able to keep working on the web comic um, up until I handed in the first book, which I fully intended to do, and that's why. I was able to get, I think, about 19 pages uh, out of it uh, before I realized that doing a graphic novel and being a dad is a lot of work. <laughs> and it was just, there was, I mean, I, just, I wasn't able to do it. I feel bad because I really, I, I really planned on finishing the story. I had it all written out. I really liked the story. Um, and I wanted to, I really wanted to give fans, you know, a complete, complete story. And, um, I think I'm never going to forgive myself for not being able to finish it, but I think it'll be, in the long run, it'll be worth it. Um, I mean, I do plan on finishing the story arc within the confines of the books, but, uh, but yeah, that was the thing. And so, anyway, being, but, but the webcomics, they seem to be okay with it. Um, there's really no changes other than that. Um, when they asked to do, you know, to, if they could you know, published play passion space. There, one of the first requests was, "Can I make her younger?" Um, and which was no big deal at all because I was like, "Well, yeah, I'm gonna do an origin story. Of course, she's gonna be younger." Um, I think they initially wanted her maybe a little younger than they made her, but um, I said, "Well, look, she's she's flying a spaceship, she's shooting ray guns. You know, to make her, you know, any younger than 15, I think would be irresponsible." <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so we kind of settled on that, which actually, you know, after thinking about it, I was like, yeah, I pretty much write her as a 15-year-old anyways. So I, I went about and I just wrote exactly the book I would have written for myself, and they were happy with it. So there really are no changes in terms of the, the style, the tone, anything like that. It's just great. Um, I think fans of the webcomic are going to, I think they'll like the graphic novel even better because it's a stronger story and the art's better. Um, and they're going to really, it really gets into the root of the character, uh, what motivates her, things like that, uh, which to me makes it a more interesting story. Um, hopefully it's still funny, too. I think it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> she still has. Yeah. Have your fans given you any reaction? Because I'm assuming that once the Scholastic work is published, you're not going to have it available on your website the same way you've had your webcomics available, obviously. Um, so a lot of, right now, a person can go and read everything you've done on Cleopatra in Space from the beginning to where it's, to where you've currently stopped. But once the books come out, the graphic novels with the new materials come out, if they want to see any of that newer material, they have to go and buy the book now. They can't just go and view it on your webcomic. I'm assuming that that's going to be the case. Um, have you gotten any reaction from your fans in regards to that? Uh, yeah, well, I think most of them are pretty excited about it. Um, you know, even though they, yeah, I guess they have to buy the book, but I think most are most are happy to, to just have more new material, whether they have to buy the book or if they can get it for free or, or whatnot. Um, and in this way, at least, they'll have, instead of, like, you know, one page per article updated every week, which is, you know, the most, like, 50 pages a year, um, they'll get, like, a, you know, a, you know 170 pages of a story in a year, um, which I think, I think for a lot of people it's better. I think they would prefer that. Um, I know I would prefer that, so I don't know. Um, there's been a couple through, I think, that, you know, just, all right, well, I'm, I only read web comics, so I'm done, and that's fine. Um, and, I mean, it doesn't bother me. But, like, I think most people are pretty happy to just, whether it's online or it's a book, just to have more material, more more story. I think most are very excited about that. As long as they got more Cleo, they're happy. <laughs> Say again? I said, as long as they're getting more Cleo, they're happy. Yeah, exactly. And uh, they just have to, I guess, wait a little longer for it. Um, it's funny, it's, I, I, I actually don't read a lot of web comics, but when I do, um, I usually wait for, like, the print versions of them to come out, um, just because I, I usually like to read a story all at once, I don't usually like to kind of split it up, so uh, my tendency is kind of, 
kind of weight anyway. So uh, I guess I kind of hope that's what a lot of my fans kind of see as well. But, you know, it's... Well, since we, we know that um, Scholastic tends to skew younger, um, and uh, in many instances, even potentially to elementary school, because a lot of the elementary schools like to use the graphic novels as a great way to transition and get their kids to, to read at higher levels, especially young boys, you know, that don't really like reading the novels and things of that nature. They can definitely tie them in and make them want to read more by giving them graphic novels and things of that nature. So there's a very specific segment of graphic novels that are skewed towards that age bracket, which is probably why when you mentioned earlier that um, Scholastic was wanting you to make her a little bit younger, it's probably because they know kind of the demographic that their um, their label kind of goes towards. Um, but I know for, from what I know of other people who have published with Scholastic, once you open the doors to that younger readership, man, um, you'll be open to school visits, um, presentations around the country, and all kinds of stuff like that, because it's, it's going to open the open the lid on, on the number of people that know about your comic and, and the content. Um, so, uh, are you ready? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, it's, well, I was... I, you know, I get asked that a lot. Uh, yes, it's actually probably one of the bigger questions I get when, when people, like, at the conventions and stuff when I find out about this classic deal. And, like, my first answer is, my, my first thought, you know, is, like, how how on earth would I ever get the book, the, you know, the books done if I was doing all of that? Um, and because, uh, I mean, I... I it really takes me a good solid year to, to, to get an entire graphic novel done. So, so yeah, no, I'm not ready. And, you know, I'm not very, I'm not a big fan of, not really a big fan of, uh, of talking in front of people. Um, even kids, you know, I think that's even more, oh, sometimes even more nerve-wracking, um, talk in front of kids, but, uh, well, I'm definitely open to it. <laughs> and if somebody wants me, he, said, he says with trepidation. I'll, uh, I, I think that maybe the more I do it, the more I, I get used to it. And I, I would love, you know, to 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 open kids up to to, to more graphic novels, more comics, uh, just just more reading stories in general, things like that. Uh, anything I can do to help that, I would definitely you know, be be doing, you know, I'd be all for for talking if that helps. Um, you know, part of the, the reason I I wanted to go with a publisher like Scholastic was to get the book into more kids' hands. Uh, in fact, that's the main reason, right there. Um, I don't think I don't think web comics is a suitable format. Right as it is, as it stands right now, I think it's getting closer. But if you want to reach out to more kids, I think you need to have a physical book, and I think you need to have a, a, a publisher that's able to get those books in those kids' hands. And Scholastic would we'll do that. Um, so I knew if I if I did want to make you know if I did want to continue with Cleopatra's space and, and somehow make a living out of it, um, that's what needed to be done. And not only that, but I want I want kids to be reading the book um, more than anybody because just like when I was a kid, I, like when I discovered Bone, you know, I want kids to discover discover comics, and there aren't a lot out there for them to discover right now that I feel warrant you know them being able to go into. Oh, I want to do this. I want to do this. Um, so I don't know. That's that was that was the biggest. That was the biggest draw for me. Okay, Mike, something interesting I've noted in your your journey is you, you mentioned that the first, one of the more inspirational uh, comics that you were reading coming up was Bone, which is with Scholastic now. I think that they're, they're printing them in color now and they're printing them in graphic novels. Well, and now here you are with your Cleopatra in space under Scholastic. So it's very cool to me that the fact that you've gone from a fan to being a uh, a fellow label mate with the creator of the very book that inspired you to do what you're doing now. I, th I think it's great to see that, that cycle in your work and in your career and that, that level of progress. So congratulations. 
Oh, thanks. Thank you. That's funny. I had never even... I guess I had thought about that. <laughs> but, you know, to me, I still think of, of, of Bone as under, like, the Cartoon Books banner. And so, but yeah, you're right. That's, um, yeah, it's, it's very cool. Thank you. Well, the other thing that we hear about you is that you're an uh, ice cream enthusiast. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying so, to, I'm trying to... I'm getting older, you know. I'm trying to. I have, a, I have a son to think about now, so I'm trying to look at my cholesterol. <laughs> I'm trying not to help. So, so are you moving back towards vanilla or just sugar, or what's going on? Well, I'm just, I'm just not. I'm not going into the freezer every two days to pull it out. But yeah. The, um, uh, but yeah, yeah, I am. I love ice cream. Well, when you were in your heyday, you know, and you just, and you could have the one that was the favorite, just lip smacking, which, what, what was your um, drug of choice amongst, amongst ice cream? Ice creams. Okay. All right. Let's get into ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, hand, like, the, the, my favorite, hands down, is just, is cookie dough ice cream. And uh, Ben and Jerry's makes the best cookie dough ice cream, I think. And... Man, when I first when I first discovered when I, I mean I remember having cookie dough ice cream. It first came out when I was a kid, and I was like, "This is the greatest thing ever" because it combines like my two favorite desserts: um, vanilla ice cream and chocolate chip cookies. And it's just in dough form, which is like the superior chocolate chip cookie. So that that's been my all time favorite. Although recently, you know, you know, Ben Jerry's has put out. Um, this, they changed the name of it. It used to be called Bonnaroo Buzz after the Bonner Music Festival. Now I think it's just like Coffee Buzz or something like that. But um, oh my gosh, it's like this. It's like this coffee. It's this coffee. Oh, I say like malt. Oh, malt ice cream with like these giant chunks of Heath Bar in it with this whiskey caramel swirl in it, and it's that's probably my favorite Ben Jerry's flavor. Right. Okay, so. The best ice cream. <laughs> this is this is holiday flavored ice cream. It comes out through Bluebell, and it's it only comes out in July and Christmas. And it's called Christmas cookies and Christmas cookies in July. And I don't know the flavor of the ice cream. It's either like vanilla or like some sort of I don't know, like rich cream flavored ice cream. I don't know, vanilla. I think it's vanilla. But it's got three cookies in it. It's got snickerdoodles, chocolate chips, and sugar. And it's got this, like, frosting swirl in it and these sprinkles. These, I'm not even a big sprinkles fan, but these sprinkles are, like, the best part of the ice cream. They're these giant sugary, just, they're, I don't know, they're sprinkles. They're good. It's just, like, the best, <laughs> it's the best ice cream. Uh... And you can only get it like twice a year, so you have to stock up on it when you can get it. And <laughs> Blue Bell's pretty good. Yeah. We, we, uh, we threw this question in there. So when you are doing those school interviews, you're going to be prepped for those really hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the little kids would probably love that. That would be an awesome way to pull them into the conversation, to be like, this is my favorite. What's your favorite? And just watch all those little hands just shoot up. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, I'd much rather sit there and talk about ice cream. <laughs> 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 How they should get in the comics. Yeah. yeah, I think we just sent you off into a binge. I wouldn't be surprised at all if once you hang up with us, you're going to either head to the store or hit your freezer and, and indulge. Uh, I've got, I got some butter buzz in the freezer. And, yeah, I'll probably, I'll probably think of that tonight. <laughs> well, I think we've wrapped up all of our questions for you, Mike. It's been great talking to you. Hey, it's great talking to you guys. Yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun. Um, where can people find your work, and uh, you know how can they get in touch with you? Um, well, um, I'm usually on Twitter mostly of of all the different social networks, and it's just you know Twitter Mike Mayhack, um, and my website's MikeMayhack.com. dot com. Facebook is Facebook Mike Mayhack. Even our, it's Mike Mayhack. You know, just type my name into Google, I think. <laughs> it's, it's it sounds really hard to find you. <laughs> we'll definitely look we'll through it. It's not easy to spell, so maybe that'll be the most difficult part. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
again, Mike, thank you so much for, for coming onto our show and letting us and talking to us a little bit more about your your career um, and your process and um, all the different things that have gone into making you the um, exceptional creator that you are today. Um, we, de- we deeply appreciate you being a part of our show. Well, thanks for having me on the show. Thanks for joining us for this podcast. Be sure to come by our blog to find articles, interviews, and resources to help fuel your education and growth. You can find us at onceuponasketch.com, Facebook, Twitter, and on YouTube.